Okay, so uh, when managed properly, stress can lead to greater growth and expansion of potential, basically. However, it takes expertise and experience and knowledge to reap those rewards. So today's roundtable discussion on prioritizing workplace stress management aims to help viewers gain insight on implementing better mental wellness programs at their workplaces and drive greater employee health and organization uh, productivity overall. So for this, our panelists uh, will focus extensively on employee relations, employee well-being, and the importance of mental wellness in the modern workplace. For that, we have uh, Antara Vinay Chandran. Uh, she's the head of client engagement and training at Silver Oak Health. We have uh, Prayag Sharma, employee relation, Taza Tech Private Limited, and Smita Nair, head of well-being, India BNY Mellon. So I welcome uh, Antara to take over and take the discussion forward. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ashan. Um, good evening once again, everyone. And thank you for joining us for these 60 minutes today. As I was reflecting on today's topic, I couldn't but help uh, go back to about 20 odd years ago when I first joined the workforce. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself. I'm, I'm clearly putting myself in a box there, but you know, stay with me. Now, I, I don't remember you know, 20 years ago, anyone talking about stress or about mental wellness, mindfulness, et cetera. That's one thing that I don't remember anyone in the workforce talking about it. I don't remember thinking about any of this for myself either. Now, as I look back, the image that comes to mind is that of an ostrich with its head buried in the sand, you know? If I couldn't see it, this thing probably didn't exist. Now fast forward to 2020 and the globe, our world was hit with a situation no one had imagined. And while mental health and stress management had by then entered the workplace in these last 20 odd years, the pandemic really put the spotlight firmly on stress management, mental well-being, like never before. And then add to this, the younger generation that's entering the workforce, it's a very different world for Gen Z, which is the newest entrant into this workflow, uh, into this workforce that we're all part of now. Gen Z is globally connected in a way that hadn't happened before. This is a generation that's thinking about purpose, it's a generation that's thinking about meaning and about balance in a way that's very different than a couple of generations ago. In a survey that was conducted in May 2022, which is just a few months back, 50% of the respondents to that survey were in the 24 to 34 age group. And they stated that they were feeling more stressed or anxious during the past 12 months. Now here we're talking about Gen Y. In that same survey, 28% of respondents in the 16 to 24 age group, that's Gen Z, stated that they experienced the same level of stress and anxiety as before. We're definitely talking about stress more than we've done in the past. Now, a different survey by Deloitte India found that 80% of the Indian workforce reports mental health issues with workplace as the top stressor. So, of course, we want to talk about stress management at the workplace. We want to normalize these conversations. And today's roundtable is one such step in that direction. I'm so pleased to be able to have a conversation with me, Smita and Prayag. Before we move any further, I'd like to invite all of you in the audience to use the Q&A panel to post your questions. If you've got some thoughts, comments, insights, put them in there. We will be taking questions throughout the remaining 50, 56 minutes. Um, so put them in the Q&A panel as you think of them, and I will bring them to our panelists at an appropriate time. With that being said, Smitha, I want to go to you with this question. You know, when we consider the socio cultural and generational context at the workplace today, is there a fundamental paradigm shift that needs to occur at an organizational culture level to normalize stress management conversations? I'd 
definitely say yes. And I'd like to uh, go back to what you stated in terms of how when the pandemic started, things came to the forefront. And when, and I'm going to benchmark myself as well when it comes to the age and say that 20 years ago, this wasn't something that anybody spoke about. It was like, deal with it. This is what life is all about. Mm. And it wasn't given the same kind of importance that it's given now. While there's been a shift, I personally believe that a lot more can be done mm. in changing the way we look at it, the way the conversations happen. So yes, uh, there are sporadic conversations. Can we say it's a blanket approach that everybody takes? Not really. There still is some stigma around mental health, being able to talk about what is it that you're going through, not just at in your personal lives, but at the workplace too. How would I be perceived if I bring this topic up? Is this going to be detrimental to my future, to my career in the organization? These are some thoughts that do come up in the mind of an employee. And the shift that I think is quite necessary would be uh, being able to have more honest conversations around the topic. And this should start initially, at least from a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. The leaders need to actually be not just speaking about it, but also ensure that there are cognitive measures that are taken to reduce the say and do gap mm. by being vulnerable themselves. I think that would be something that would definitely help in encouraging these conversations at the workplace. Uh, thank you, Smitha. I know that gap that you spoke about between what we say and what we do, we hear things like walking the talk, but really what does that mean? And also to your point of this kind of a shift in conversation is a cultural shift. It's a way of doing things differently today, staying with the times, and that that typically would need to come from the top because they set the tone. Leaders set the tone for where the organization goes. Praya, you know, I'm seeing I'm seeing you nod. I want to come to you with that same question: is where is your mind right now when you think about that shift? that needs to occur um, to normalize stress management conversations. Yes, of course, so first of all, good evening, everyone. And uh, yeah, when you talk about uh, this shift, like uh, at an organization level, yes, of course, because uh, sometimes, you know, one can get uh, so overwhelmed at work, then they start, you know, losing confidence and may become irritable and even like at times, you know, withdrawn. So what we have seen over the time that it leads to, you know, less productivity and, uh, even like uh, less effectiveness and uh, which eventually makes the work seems uh, less rewarding. So this can be a warning sign of being in a stressful situation. <clears throat> and in, uh, I, see, I see like, you know, if one starts ignoring the warning signs of like, you know, being in stress. And so it's, it can even like at the end of the day, it can, lead, it can also lead to bigger problems as well, uh, beyond interfering like, you know, with your job performance and satisfaction, that chronic stress, can uh, can also uh, you know lead to physical and kind of you know, emotional health problems. So rather than you know thinking about too much, planning your work too far in advance, which I think in most instances can lead to anxiety. And one can do it daily, like you know, uh, like working on uh, one's agenda for the next day and setting up the priorities and uh, you know unfinished business from the day before. So if it's really a huge project, like like a huge task. One can prepare on like breaking down into uh, breaking down large goals into like kind of small objectives which are achievable within a timeline. So mm -hmm. I have like uh, we have also kind of you know thought from that perspective wherein like you know we brought in uh, objectives, setting up uh, objectives and key results like which we really call it like OKR model, and we really set it up in our organization so that people can easily achieve their set of goals without taking burden on themselves. So that's what I feel. Uh, Prayag, thank you. And uh, I was just so pleased to hear you talk about some specific things that you're doing. So I'll, I'll stay with you because I want to go a little bit deeper with um, a few things, a few concrete steps that organizations could take to make stress management. Um, let's talk about stress management resources. You know, you're talking about how do you handle it. But when you think about for an organization having stress management resources, 
what couple of things, two or three, could an organization take to make these resources accessible to everyone? You know, down breadth, just yeah. everywhere in the organization. Well, that's a worse question, and I'm glad that you asked this because I see it from the perspective of like you know setting up planning and prioritization. Because if these two things are not in place. Nothing's going to work out. So planning and prioritizing the things are very crucial when you have more tasks on your plate than you accomplish in one day. Mm -hmm. This really helps, you know, this really helps a person to work faster and more efficiently. And that's what we have observed within our organization as well. And I'm not really sure about the organizations, but that's that's what all studies also suggest. And this in return, in turn, like, you know, means that we don't miss deadlines and mm -hmm. at the same time have getting less stressed. So I touch firstly on like prioritization, uh, prioritization, like you know, which includes like you know, while you're creating your balanced schedule, like you know, you analyze your schedule, your responsibilities, and daily tasks. All work and no play is a recipe for burnout. That's what we have seen, uh, especially during the COVID phase, which is Mita was talking initially. So we need to try out, try to find a balance between work and family life, social activities, solitary pursuits, right? daily responsibilities and downtime. Mm -hmm. So we, what we really have to do, make a list of tasks which we really have to achieve and tackle them in, in order in the order of importance. Mm -hmm. Do the high priority items first, rather than you know doing like directly jumping on those items which are not really of high importance. So if you have something particularly unpleasant to do, get it over with early. The rest of your day will be more pleasant as a result. Mm -hmm. Now, second thing which I see, like don't overcommit yourself. So what we are specifically across IT industry, we have seen like, you know, we do overcommit to the clients just to, you know, meet, just to make, uh, keep them satisfied and, you know, keep them happy. So avoid scheduling things back to back or trying to fit too much, uh, too much into one day. So that's the, that's one of the things like, you know, which eventually, <laughs> sorry, which eventually leads to like, you know, being in stress, stressful situations. All too often, all too often, like, you know, we underestimate how long things will take. If you have got too much on your plate, you have. We really have to, you know, distinguish between the shoulds and the must. Mm -hmm. So drop that. Drop. You know, it's it's all about like you know bifurcating the tasks that are truly that are not truly necessary to the bottom of the list or eliminate them entirely. Now, third thing is like try to leave earlier in the morning. So which is it sounds very awkward, like you know, for every one of us. But it's even still like you know, if you are enough, if you are hurry, if you are in a hurry. In the morning hours, even like you know, 10, 15 minutes can make the difference between frantically rushing to the, your desk and having time to ease into your day. So mm -hmm. don't add to your stress levels by running late. So that's one of these things people have started like you know, going to the office. So that's again one of the things like you know, which eventually, which starts your day on a very uh, on a very stressful note. So we have to you know avoid that thing as well. Like plan regular breaks. So this is this is something which I really find it important to plan regular breaks between the work. Make sure to take short breaks throughout the day or to, to, uh, to walk or maybe like you know, sit back and enjoy with uh, and have a chit chat uh, with, uh, with teammates and like, you know, play games that are available within the office or maybe at, back at home. Also try to get away from your desk or workstation for lunch. So that's again, uh, which comes under like, you know, having the break you know, taking a time off from the work that you are, that, are, that is really, really pushing you into like, you know, in the, into these stressful situations. Stepping away from like, you know, work to briefly relax and recharge will help you be more productive rather than, you know, having uh, like, you know, coming up with the less productivity. Delegate responsibility. So de delegate the tasks, right? You, you really don't have to be, to do it all yourself. If other people can take care of the task, why not let them, let them do it. Let go of the desire, you know, to control or oversee every little step. You will be letting off, or you will be letting go of unnecessary stress in the process. Now, last thing which comes under, like you know, which I see from my perspective in the uh, in, in prioritization is be willing to compromise when you ask someone to contribute differently to a task, revise a deadline, or change their behavior at work. Be willing to do the same. Sometimes, if you can both bend a little you will be able to find a happy middle ground that reduces the stress levels for everyone concerned. So if ultimately it comes, it, you know, it boils down to like when you have a lot of things to do, it's very, very important to fully concentrate on your priorities one at a time without looking at anything else. 
that's about it. Sure. Well, uh, Prayag, thank you. So many different tips. And even if we can take away one or two from everything you've shared, you know, I think that goes a long way in our individual ability to manage our stress a little bit better than we did maybe 15 minutes ago. Uh, Smitha, I want to come to you with a specific question that takes us um, above the everyday and individual to the org level, right? So stay with me at that high level org and talk to us about from an employee well-being perspective, when an organization looks at employee well-being and now, you know, increasingly we're thinking about stress management resources that are being put in place. What are a couple of steps that perhaps maybe your organization's already taking to make these resources available equitably? Or perhaps you could talk about some best practices even, but I'd, I'd leave that to you. So talk to us about stress management mm -hmm. resources being equitably accessible to um, employees in an organization. Sure. So I'd like to take a step back before getting into the resources. Mm -hmm. I think something that's very crucial for at an organization level is to um, advocate and actually, uh, like you spoke, walk the talk about having a psychologically safe workplace. Mm -hmm. So getting, we can have the tools and resources in place, but if there's no encouragement yeah. to let the employee share what he or she feels like and be able to take those conversations to the next level, then uh, resources and tools won't really matter much. It is about mm -hmm. ensuring that, and you spoke about uh, equity, right? Mm -hmm. No matter who you are, where across levels, be able to <clears throat> put things across. So that's something that I think it's quite crucial at in any organization. So having that safe uh, place to share. From a tools and resources perspective, there are a lot of things that organizations do. Um, one of the things that comes to the top of my mind is having a robust employee assistance program. Mm -hmm. So where there might not be in-house tools and resources available, ensuring that we have partners who can uh, help in our journey towards speaking about the various difficult conversations and helping our employees navigate through these situations. Stress could be because of a lot of reasons, not necessarily only workplace related. It something that's happening at home could have an effect in your work life and vice versa. So having someone who's impartial to who you are in the organization and being able to share and have those conversations is something I think that works. And even within the organization, have a support system, a group that actually, um, so something that can be looked at is um, having mental health first aiders. Mm -hmm. So no matter who you are, where you are, you know that there is a support group that you have your mental health first aiders in the office who you can reach out to and have those conversations in terms of what is it that could be done in terms of tips. Uh, Priyak, in fact, very beautifully put in what are the micro steps that need to be taken. Yeah. So from an organization level, it's about creating the environment, having those resources available, and creating awareness that the resources are available. So many times we find employees and they're not aware what is available in terms of support. So mm -hmm. having that ongoing dialogue across levels continuously on an ongoing basis is what would help in terms of uh, ensuring that there's uh, awareness and there's an uptake of the resources that are available. Smita, thank you. I was uh, listening to you and thinking of, yes, you know, it's, it's one thing to say you have these five resources that you can use, but we've been talking about this for a while now, at least for the last 19 minutes, about there is a certain perception that's attached to talking about stress, to talking about our mental health, to talking about, um, I'm not feeling okay, not physically, but mentally. You know, this past year also with uh, Mental Health Awareness Day in October, the theme was it's okay to not be okay. That's a big deal. It's a very heavy loaded statement. It's okay to not be okay. And to use your words, do I feel, 
Am I provided with enough safety, psychological safety, to say that I'm not feeling okay? To say that maybe I need a day off to take care of myself. I am physically fine, but I just need a day to get away from everything. And is my team okay with hearing something like that? Is my leader okay with that as a reason? for me to take some time off, right? To manage. And, and that's a very good point here, like Arthur, because it's a, it's a very important thing in our, you know, when I see it from the uh, work perspective at an organization level, because you have to have like, you know, proper communication channel, right? You know, it, there has to be improvement in the communication. When you're sharing information with your teammates to reduce uncertainty, like, you know, having the proper communication in a friendly and efficient manner, and you are just making sure that your teammates are uh, clear about their what is expected out of them, and right. So, and you are praising them for the good work they are doing, and you are offering the opportunities for like you know uh, professional development, wherein a person can you know excel and offer opportunities to even transition in the skills, right? And having that friendly social climate within the organization that keeps that is really really important from you know from yeah. from, uh, from my perspective. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Priya. And you know, we, Silver Oak Health, we are an uh, employee assistance program provider. So we've really got our skin in the game yeah. with, hey, it's available. And to make, uh, to make a program like that available virtually is, Smita, you also use the word equitable. That's a step in the direction of providing equity. No matter where you are, you've got this resource available. And then to your point, Priya, communication is key. We've got to consistently stay with building awareness um, to building acceptance. And what are we rewarding as an organization? Do we reward, so I'm going back to Smita, what you were talking about before is, do we reward, for example, uh, somebody seeking assistance? Is there a way to reward it? And I don't mean giving something, a reward can be anything, but what we reward gets done more and more, right? That's how we establish behaviors. So at an organizational level, thinking about how are we communicating to borrow a word from you, Prayag, and how are we building awareness to borrow from you, Smita, on what resources are available and how do we encourage our folks to seek that out and use those resources? Okay, well, um, Smita, I'll go back to you with uh, what I was thinking next about, you know, staying with stress management resources. What does it mean? <laughs> to put the right tools in place in a way that an organization is making a long-term shift in culture as it relates to stress management? I'd say um, it needs to be a 360 degree approach. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the person who's going through stress that needs support. It's the person who's going to be listening to the person who needs to have that interaction with the person, that person would also need support in terms of, especially because like we've already covered before, the fact that conversations around uh, stress and not being okay are still stigmatized and it's still taboo. So if somebody, for example, comes to me and says, I'm stressed, I shouldn't be caught unaware saying, how do I respond to this? Mm -hmm. so I need to be given the resource and the toolkit as well to be able to respond appropriately, have empathy and that emotional intelligence to be able to accept what is being shared and not be not have any kind of an unconscious bias. So mm -hmm. having resources, tools, conversations around these things is in an ongoing manner, continuously, is what would uh, help in having a long-term shift. That, that's personally what I believe. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, again, while you were talking about it, I was thinking, I was picturing, you know, this image in my head of as uh, when we talk about, again, building on your psychological safety before and now saying, what tools do we have? One of the tools is to empower uh, team leaders, managers, all the way up, people who are responsible for other people, empowering them with the right tools, which may be a communication kit, it may be access to counseling themselves, whatever that is, manager sensitization programs like we offer, for example, how do you as a manager deal with, how do you react to or respond to somebody coming up to you and saying, I have this 
I'm having this issue or whatever. I can't handle something because of X, Y, Z. In a way that's respectful and not reductivist, no? Like you don't want to as managers say, oh, but that's something you'll be fine tomorrow. That's not for me to say. Knowing that that's not for me to say, how do I then as an organization train these people who are managing other people to access the tools that will enable emotional intelligence and uh, conversations. Uh, Prayag, what are you thinking about when you think about what other, what, what can we, what does it mean to put the right tools in place to commit to a long-term shift in organizational culture as you think about stress management? So I see from, uh... From the perspective of like it's it's kind of you know leadership's best interest like you know to keep workplace stress to a minimum that's that's the one thing and which is really really again uh, kind of important which i feel because executives can you know executives in the organization can act as positive role models someday especially in times of you know high stress if a manager as a manager can stay calm in stressful uh what situations it is much easier for the teammates as well to stay calm so i like i said you know there has to be a proper communication like make mm -hmm. communication friendly and efficient uh, avoid unrealistic deadlines show that you are valued you as as a team member you are valued offer them rewards and incentives mm -hmm. promote and kind of you know entrepreneurial work environment that gives everyone more control over their work and in terms of like, you know, having that social climate, uh, friendly social environment within the organization, provide opportunities for social interaction between each other, mm. uh, make management actions consistent with the values of the organization. Like you have to comply with the values with what you are cherishing within the organization. And lastly, uh, organizing like weekly fun activities or activities that can have positive impact on person's well-being. For, for instance, like, you know, we, we frequently do it and we, we are still doing it in our organization like we do organize uh of like fun activities be it like you know corporate yoga zumba team building activities mm -hmm. as 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 many as possible so that they can they can take some time off from the work that they have they have you know they are responsible to be responsible to look after sure, sure. well thank you thanks prayag uh, if you could just pause you for a minute there's a question that's come in chat smita and prayag and uh, we don't know uh, names, obviously, so anonymous attendee um, is uh, one of the individuals now with the question. Let me see if I can um, frame this up for you and whoever wants to take a jab at um, answering the question, yeah? So what we're hearing is that companies are sometimes wanting fewer number of associates to complete larger number of tasks and uh, in the process with a lot needing to be done by one person, it creates more stress on one person. Um, your thoughts on this as we talk about managing stress in the workplace? So I see uh, uh, that's again taking me back to what we have already discussed about like, you know, managing the time, even if the company is doing that, which is real, which is not a good thing to do in my opinion. But even if the, uh, if, if uh, like, you know, company is doing it, like person should, be able to you know manage the time. There has to be a proper time management, which is again a part of you know prioritizing the task. Mm -hmm. You always have to know how much time you need to complete a certain task. It's when you are doing multiple tasking. If you are a multitasker, that's a good thing to have. That's a good quality. But yeah, you have to. You always have to know how much time you need to complete a certain task. Create short term deadlines rather than you know thinking having too much too many things on the plate and you are you know, you're not able to finish any of them. So short-term deadlines will help, definitely help you to make a habit of meeting deadlines. It will also force you to get things done. That's the reality. That way, when the long-term deadline does arrive, you won't have as much pressure and work built up. Second thing, you can avoid perfectionism. If you demand perfection, you might not even start a task because you are worried it, you are worried it won't be perfect. So yes. don't have that tendency to have that perfectionism every time. Doing your best is fine. Giving yourself enough time to do your best will reduce, will definitely reduce the stress. Manage your commitments. Making commitments can be just as hard as letting them go. People who are under stress, you know, and uh, tend to have too many commitments instead of too few. But sometimes when stress comes from a lack of commitment, improving efficiency and you know, perform and productivity, that definitely allows you to get more done in less time. So it's all about managing the time better and with 
definitely helps you to make you know more relaxed and less stress as a result. Thank you. Thanks, Prayag. I was also, um, you know, building on a word that you've been using for a while now, which is prioritizing. I've been thinking about that a lot, and I am a seven habits practitioner myself. So I, I live by a lot of the, it, it, it works, for, it's worked for me with effectiveness. So I keep going back, Prayag, to when you talk about prioritization to me as well, multiple tasks and responsibilities and 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 the resulting stress is a part of life and work. It's not going to go away. That's a fact of how the world works. One is we've got to accept that and then build on top of that for what can we do to manage this stress better. And for that, I go to my seven habits. And one of the things that I remember to do is um, distinguish between what's important and what's urgent. We often mix the two up and it's easy to do that in the process, creating more stress. One is, can I slow down to ask myself what's urgent, like has to get done now and what can wait? Can this get answered day after tomorrow? Do I have that flexibility? In the absence of that ability to make the decision, sometimes we don't have that visibility to be able to even make a distinction between what's important and what urgent, what's urgent is when I would say that, especially to this individual who's asking the question is speak with your manager, involve them in the process of how do I prioritize, which one's more important, which one can wait and see if you can co-create a better environment in that moment than having to feel like you have to battle it all by yourself. That would be my um, two cents. Smita, did you want to say something? Yep. I think another thing that we could look at and building upon the seven habits that you spoke about is understanding what's in your locus of control and what's out and accepting it. Everything is not in our control. It's okay to let go and you don't need to have everything in control. It's okay to drop the ball sometimes. It's not going to be the end of the world. So accepting, recognizing and accepting that stress is a part of life. And what we need to focus on is building resilience is I think what would help across when it comes to uh, not enough people being available for a task to get done or too many things that needs to be done by a single person. Prioritize and accept what is yeah going back to some of the acceptance is accept uh what um what what is and how much influence i have over a situation you know that that circle of influence versus circle of concern if i can't do anything about it i've got to then be able to train my mind to say okay you've got to just let it be and focus on what you can do about the thing that you can do something about. There are a few more questions in the question panel and we will come back to them. Um, some of them will get answered through our next few questions. So for all of you who've posted your questions, just hang in there and we'll get back uh, to your questions. Um, let me, uh, you know, we're thinking about stress, resources, tools. I also want to go back to a concept we touch upon, touched upon briefly before, which is that equitable resources, equitable access to people. So Smita, in today's world, 2022, we are digitizing like never before, at least the last few years have been, and the pandemic, I think to a degree, acted like a catalyst that sped up the process, no, of digitization. Does digitization have a role to play in scaling up stress management services at the workplace? Um, it has its pros and cons. Again, from a scaling up perspective, if awareness is there, definitely it's something that can be looked at. What we need to realize is that while uh, you can take the horse to the water, you can make it drink. So tools are available. It's about an, an individual understanding that, yes, we have a lot of mindfulness and biofeedback tools and apps that can help you relax and de-stress. 
but it, the onus is on us as individuals to actually utilize what's there and be consistent and have the discipline in ensuring that we follow the path that uh, has been uh, shared with us via an app, for example. So there are multiple apps and like say Headspace, Pacifica, they can help you with prompts, with nudges. It, so I would say digitization definitely helps in being your assistant, mm. but the actual work still needs to be done by the individual. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Smita. Uh, Prayag? I'm actually going to add like what uh, Smita said. Like, obviously, there are plenty of apps. Like, and we have seen, uh, like, from my experience, many a times, people definitely struggle to seek help for a long time because they try to solve by themselves. Like they try to solve their problems on their own. And this is digitalization has, has definitely revolutionized, uh, revolutionized it. The magic of digital solution is to give them that opportunity and empower them. An individual can also you know, take steps to improve their own mental well-being before an issue becomes acute. Like for instance, we have platforms available like Ekincare is one of them, obviously, wherein people can reach out to doctors, counselors for any kind of you know, assistance. And they also have this facility of like, like different tools have this facility of including chatbots and gamified exercises. So this definitely helps in scaling up this stress management at the workplace. Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Prayag. There was a question in chat about um, our organizations run a lot of initiatives for employee well-being around, you know, there are webinars, life fitness sessions, doctor consultations, counseling. What more or what more what what more unique things can we provide to employees while we're designing a program? I think between the two of your answers, Smita and Prayag, we did address some of that, which is why I said, let's hold on. Some things get addressed through the conversation. I'm also thinking. Additionally, one of the things I would do, and this is more of an organizational development perspective, which is um, do a pulse survey. You know, periodically do a pulse survey, work with your HR team to do it, and ask specific questions for what is it, what kind of support is your workforce asking of you? And then you will find some that are already getting answered by what you do, and then you'll probably have some ideas for what are people looking for, and then you offer that as a very custom tailored um, solution to the situation that you're facing or to what you're trying to do with wellness. Yeah, that's a very good point that you have touched here, uh, Antra, because this is also, again, an, a crucial thing to have a frequent service and, and uh, responses against them. Uh, one of the things that we uh, recently got started with, like, you know, having, a, or having an automated tool wherein, uh, wherein it will, uh, you know, it will uh, give you a trigger after a certain, at a certain interval, be asking for like, you know, how are you feeling and how, what exactly is going in your mind. So this definitely, cert this certainly helps uh, an HR team to, you know, to have this, have the sense of like, you know, okay, this person is, whether this person is happy or satisfied or not. So again, sharing your thoughts with someone with, obviously, person will share the thoughts like the with manager or HR team or anyone else within the organization, but still sharing the thoughts helps, helps the person to, you know, to release some stress, like, you know, so that they can ease out some uh, kind of, you know, whatever the anxiety level was, you know, to, so it can, it can, you know, it helps us in easing out that. Mm. Well, thanks. Um, thank you, Prayag. Yeah, there's a question, Smita and Prayag, if I could take you to another question that's coming up. And I think it also leads to a question that I was thinking to ask you, but let, let me preface it with this comment in uh, our Q&A panel, which is how do we deal with the stress that arises from a situation where there is a downsizing in an organization, which the manager doesn't necessarily control or it's not up to the manager, depending on where you are in that organization to actually do anything about it. And yet there's resultant stress from that. So keep that in mind as I ask you this next question about leadership particularly is, what is the role of leadership in establishing a culture that accepts stress? We've talked about acceptance before also, that accepts stress as a part of life and work. So uh, I... Uh... So uh, basically, it becomes definitely this, this responsibility of leadership team to uh, to ensure that uh, 
uh, to to you know to establish a culture which is kind of stress free. So uh, I think from uh, I think uh, like encouraging workplace wellness, uh, like exercise and healthy living are two of your best weapons, which I feel like against workplace stress. So uh, on on one hand, like uh, exercise takes like employees' minds of the stress of their job to focus on the task at hand, like encouraging the employees to go on a walk during lunch breaks and uh, even like bringing in a yoga, instructor, a yoga instructor into the office once a month or for healthy snacks in the office. What the objective behind it? It's just simple, like employees feel valued when they think you are looking out for their health. And a recent study also claims that like 66% of employees felt extremely or very happy when your employer is regularly is, is checking on like at a frequent at a certain intervals regularly checking on your well-being like for example like you can keep as like uh you there can be like several add-ons to it like you can keep you can stock your refrigerators and cupboards and uh and and like having healthy and fresh fresh snack options that's one of the huge perks which you can as an organization that which is you can you, you can provide second thing which i see like you know revamp the habitat like a lot of, a lot of stress comes from the environment think about every aspect of your office space and what this what it does or does not do for the wellness of your team simple things like the quality of the coffee or the height of the cubicle walls can definitely affect employee engagement like another thing which uh, i can think of uh, Allowing for like flexible hours and more remote working, because that's that's the dire of like there's a need of the hour. Like it's very really important. People actually look for like remote working, and uh, you allow your employees to work remotely and uh, give flexibility for start and end times. This freedom is great for office morale, and the policy shows employees that show uh, shows employees that you trust them enough not to babysit, right? So. Uh, encourage social activity as well and having the having like creating quiet environment stress can't be completely avoided i totally agree with it but you can help alleviate it when it arrives mm -hmm. ensure that your teammates have a place where can where they can take a break and you are also like providing the counseling sessions to them recognizing them employ it's it's really it's very it's very important thing to understand for like for all of us like employees love being praised for a job well done and we have seen over the time, like recognizing their success results in a serious boost in engagement. Mm -hmm. Each member has a different personality. So you, we really have to be mindful when considering how and when to recognize, right? However you choose to recognize, your teammates will appreciate that you are aware of their success and want to share it with others. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all of those. Uh all of those tips again. And as for those of us who are in positions of leadership, there's just a lot to take away and think about and find what works with our style of leadership. And we, don't, we don't have to do everything, but there'll be certain things that go with our leadership style and our values and you, you work with those and um, enable that culture that's accepting stress as a part of life and work. Smitha, where's your mind at when you think about the role of leadership in establishing this culture that accepts stress? I think the first thing that comes to my mind, Antara, is uh, transparency mm. and being vulnerable. So all leaders would also go through stress. They're humans too. So it's about, it's a two-way street, actually, when we speak about establishing a culture. It cannot be one party that establishes the culture. Both need to work together. So it's it's about understanding that some things can be changed, some can't. But having that conversation saying, you know, I've heard you. I understand where you're coming from. This is what I can do. This is what's in my control. Some things are out of my control, but I do understand and I empathize. If there's something that could be done, I will do that. So having those conversations, being open to dialogue, I think is something that would definitely help in establishing a culture that accepts stress as a part of everyone's life. Right. Smita, thanks. And once again, I was thinking of, you know, when you said there are some things that are always going to be outside our control, we are never going to be able to control everything. 
um, in our lives as managers also leaders of people we don't control there are so many unknowns that we're constantly living with and in and that takes me back to the comment that I also asked both of us you know both of you to keep in mind when you were respond to, responding to this question which is how do we deal with stress that's beyond the control of the manager like downsizing for example and um, I love what you said about is it in my circle of influence no business will make decisions for the business and um, that's the that's the contract that we have with the business when i'm employed that's the contract i'm signing with the business right now is it a situation that we want to downsize very likely no but that's the need now as a leader of this team where say two people are getting um uh, are 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 impacted by downsizing did i make the decision no so to the, to the point of this person asking the question but i still have to do something about if i'm being asked what do I do? And that's where I'm thinking of what you said, Smita, is I've got to be available to, to really listen. Empathy goes a long way. And it's not about paying lip service to I am I'm empathizing with you. It's how deeply Absolutely. do I listen? And perhaps in a situation like that, if you do have an employee assistance program, that's the time to really recommend Bend. employee assistance. You know, this is the situation. We cannot control it. It's happening. You're experiencing it. Can I encourage you to speak to a counselor, to get some support, to get that impartial ear of somebody listening who doesn't know me, my history, what I'm doing, why I was laid off. None of that is important. It's this person whose job it is to listen to me and help me unpack my feelings. So at some point, I think as leaders, we also have to know where our ability to help stops because we can't do everything, but we can be resourceful enough to point people in the right direction. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping that the individual who asked us that question about downsizing has a sense of where to go with it, uh, with um, being a leader in that situation. Uh, Smith and Prayago, right? You know what? We're we're almost heading towards where we're going to have to close out. And I know we have some questions that we haven't answered, and this is for our audience today. Um, with, between Ishan and Akshay, we'll figure out how we can get to those questions. But I do have one before we start winding down. I wanted to ask both of you and Prayag, maybe I'll go to you first. Is you've shared so much of this before, but tell us again, and this time maybe give us your three, all right? So what's your personal mantra? to manage stress, Prayag? Well, if I have to tell you the crux of it, like, you know, I definitely believe, like, it basically boils down to, like, depending on, like, active listening and empathy. That's what we have just discussed about. Like, mm. you definitely need to actively speak to your employees to understand what they actually need, what they are actually seeking for. Employee well-being depends on it. Trust me. Either you can use or a tool to get the polls or having frequent check-ins on their well-being so that they remain engaged. That's the that's our ultimate objective. So that's that's something what I believe, you know, to have frequent one-on-ones, frequent interaction with them to check on their well-being. And rest of the things are add-on, add on uh, add on to it. Like you know, you can reward them, you can recognize them, but when you talk to them in person or face to face, that makes them really that that makes them really satisfied that okay like that my, my, that the organization is definitely concerned about me. Thank you. Thanks, Prayag. Smitha, what about you? Your personal mantra to managing stress? I have quite a few in fact. <laughs> <laughs> The first thing that I definitely look at and is a go-to for me is something called a samabriti pranayam, which all of us would know as box breathing. So that mm -hmm. helps me instantly take a step back with breathing, help me relax. So that's something, and it doesn't take time. You don't need to be in a specific place. You don't need to have an environment because it's breathing. It's just about focusing on how you breathe. So that's something that helps me. Um, when I'm at home, my pet is, uh, I have a lab. He is a great stress buster. So just looking at him, taking him for a, so a stroll, that itself is sufficient, a small game. That helps considerably. Um, Lo-fi music is another thing that helps me because these beats help tune out stress and it helps relax the brain. So that's something that personally has worked for me. 
And um, one last thing, from a long-term perspective, I do practice Qigong, which is, again, uh, a juxtaposition of uh, breathing as well as body movement. It's a holistic approach that helps me heal from within and make me more resilient. These are the things that personally work for me when it comes to managing stress. Thank you. Those were so many, and some of them I can identify with because I, I do a couple of them. The breathing, for example, is one of my, and I'll share three. One is the breathing that you've already talked about, so I wouldn't belabor that. It's that, you know, to your point, you can be anywhere. You don't need any apparatus to do it. You just decide and you do it in that moment. Um, that's one. The second is, uh, Priya, you were talking about exercise and you spoke about it as well. For me, it's my morning runs. I run three days a week and I walk our dogs four days in the morning, but I've got something going for me physically every day because that time that I have is just time for myself. And for example, when I'm running, I don't have the capacity to think about anything else. It's just running. And since I run on the road a lot, just staying alive. And if I'm on the treadmill, then <laughs> making sure my laces don't go elsewhere, you know, you've got to be in that moment with the run. So I truly value uh, my running time and um, the, the third thing that I would do so I we spoke about oh the third thing is uh, going back to my seven habits again the pause it's a lifetime practice is learning to take a pause choosing to pause so I can decide what to do next and that has helped me slow down from being a an instinctively reactive person to a more deliberate, responsive person. That's been, for me, it's been powerful. It's not easy. It's still not easy to do, but I'm a lot more conscious of it. And I've been able to slow down. And I think it's, you know, it even ties to that whole idea of mindfulness, which is that being in the moment, that pause lets me also be in the moment and think about right now, what is it that I want to say or do or not say, not do. Yeah. So those were my three um, personal mantras to manage stress in the short term and, yeah. uh, and the long term. Something that I'd like to highlight over here, Ankhra, is when each of us spoke about our personal mantras, the onus was always on us and not somebody yeah. else. So that's something I think that is a takeaway that you own your stress and yeah. how to manage it. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yes. That is, that is, that is so true. And even the asking for help, we've got to be willing to ask, right? Otherwise we may even get a solution that we don't need. <laughs> That's the worst case scenario. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, before we wrap up and I hand the stage back over to Ishan, there is a question here from Birju. Um, if I could just get the both of you to look at that, Smita and Priya, because that would not be, a, a, it doesn't need a lot of con context setting perhaps, which is why I thought we'll get to that one, is we do a lot of webinars and other initiatives. However, participation seems to be always um, low. Uh, how do we increase participation for wellness and beyond and events? Uh, do you have a like one thing to think about, Smita? I'd say get... Uh employees who have benefited from it to speak about it there's no better brand ambassador than that i was thinking of that to ambassadorship that was the first word yeah. that came to mind when i thought of that okay thank you and uh, prayag what are you thinking yeah give them the ownership of like uh uh to to experience uh the uh, the thing like so that they can understand the value of it so it's it's all about like it's it's very it's kind of you know unless you go through it you don't understand the significant of it significance mm -hmm. of it so that's what that's what it is like it's it's like me giving them the ownership of like you know, to understand that's how you can increase the participation yeah thank you thanks prayag and and Birju, the one thing i would add to both things that you've heard from uh, smita and prayag is with with uh, these human efforts, you know, where you're talking about things like say diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, or you do wellness and beyond. Um, we've got to be able to measure success differently than the regular skill building attendance kind of programs, because it's not tangible. It's harder to touch and feel and know that, oh, I've seen 10 people, therefore. So see if you can um, even uh, 
with, with the sponsor of these programs, think about you know, a third alternative to how do we measure success for programs like this. Personally, I'd much rather if I had, say, a, an, a base of 100 associates, random example, I'd much rather have five people show up who want to be there and make a change than 100 people show up to sign a sheet and no one's bothered with what really went on. So we've got to think a little bit with things like this, how to measure and what we truly want to measure also. Something I'd think about. Yeah. I'll see it's 4.55 and I do want to give it back to Ishan to kind of wrap up and say our, uh, uh, you know, our, our goodbyes today. And I, I, and I do recognize we have a few unanswered questions. Um, we, Ishan, I'm hoping you'll find a way to route those questions somehow, you know, we will do something about them. Uh, so thank you all for your questions to, to the audience today. Thank you for giving us 60 minutes of your time this uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, Smita and Prayag, thank you for talking through, sharing your ideas. It's, it's, it's so helpful to hear thought leaders like yourself share knowledge and help us build a community of thoughtful, well-intentioned people in the, in the workforce. Um, I am hoping that uh, we've all enjoyed the experience. We've all found it insightful. We're taking something away. And it, it's going to be different things for different people, but even one little thought that can um, change something for us individually or for the people that we touch is, um, is worth it. So once again, thank you all. And Ishan, with that, I'll hand it back to you to wrap us up today. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks to all of you and thanks for all the audience who were here and attended it. Uh, uh, regarding the questions, uh, we'll make sure that uh, we, we've taken down those questions and uh, we'll pass on to either you or uh, uh, to the experts so that we can get them answered in our future uh, uh, webinars as well. Uh, I'd personally like to thank uh, Antara, Smita, and Prayag for being here. We really learned a lot today. And uh, uh, like just not just stress management, but yeah, actually how to get into it and how to solve things for that. It was really amazing to know it from all of a few and from thought leaders like you. So really amazing. And I really want to thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for talking to all of us. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure. Well, thanks. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.